government initiatives like ALGO 360, largest alternate credit score of India with 50 million plus profiles, 10 billion plus data points, and more than 10,000 unique financial and behavioral features for every customer. Quick ID, the highest uh, rated video KYC and customer onboarding product with industry leading 80% plus journey completion rates, deep experience in setting up analytical capabilities for organization, designing analytical frameworks for key business problems across industries. He comes with 18 plus years of industry experience. Mr. Amit Das is also the co-founder of Vito, which for business is the multi-channel smart mar marketing platform. He has been an executive vice president for 3i Infotech, where he was responsible for setting up the BI and analytical capabilities at 3i Infotech, building large scale analytics, COEs for clients across the globe, and many more. He has been the PwC director, where he has managed multiple engagements, scaled the practice, helped PwC become an analytics based differentiator in the advisory marketplace. Uh, he has worked in many more companies and, and, and definitely had many more roles. I will not uh, take a list of every role that he's uh, been through. He has his expertise in building a full stack data science and AI firm from bringing data to the enterprise to helping build insights, smart insight layers and smart applications, developing data and analytics led platforms for financial services, healthcare, pharma, retail, uh, consumer oil and gas, uh, developing data and analytics led platform solutions for, for all of these firms. He has been an alumni of IIM Bangalore. We are glad to have you here, sir. I would now request Mr. Amit Das to start over with the session. Thank you so much, Anida. I hope the screen is visible. I hope I'm audible. Yes, absolutely. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great. Um, that long introduction, the short summary is that um, I started into the broader uh, analytics area about 18, 19 years back when it was not so fashionable to be here. Uh, the fact that I was an MBA who decided to do that makes it a little more of an anomaly from that generation perspective where everyone wanted to be an investment banker or a consultant. And... Uh, uh, the 18 years journey because of the timing of it also to some extent and the fact that I got lucky allowed me to have an interesting set of experiences uh, because every industry today has kind of blown up in terms of uh, the way they use uh, uh, data science, analytics, big data analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning. We love using keywords, right? So we love you know, whatever is in fashion at that point in time. That That's a keyword that comes to define us. But I think uh, the core of it all is uh, we are trying to understand uh, how data can be valuable to a business, right? In, in different uh, spaces, in different problems, in different contexts. And uh, one of the things uh, I personally struggle with a lot, and especially as the demand for data scientists has gone up, and the supply of data scientists has also gone up tremendously, is that people more often than not have forgotten what it meant to be a good data scientist or an analyst. And, and that's what I thought I'll cover through some of the examples that I had, but, but you know, uh, the intro is done, so I would not spend any time here. What I wanted to kind of cover, and, and, and this is where I hope the conversation is a little more interactive today, um, um, because, and I've used four keywords here, uh, just to kind of, uh, what I would like today's, uh, you know, session to be a little more interactive, a little more iterative, because almost 90% uh, plus of the people I work with, uh, let's say the first couple of engagements, um, a lot of time goes into this realization that uh, unless you are Rishabh Pant or Sajin Tendulkar, do not go trying to hit the first ball out of the park, right? Uh, solutions are built iterative, iteratively. Solutions take a little more time to evolve. And you've got to have a somewhat of an open mind. Uh, 
towards this broader idea that you could have made a mistake or that you would have missed something or you could have missed some data um so that's that's the second part of it the third part of it is um, a lot of people make this other mistake which is that if they find a better solution they drop the previous one like you know a bad relationship but invariably some of the best implementations of you know uh, data science that we have come across are extremely incremental extremely multifunctional so they keep building on what the previous solution was the previous idea was or sometimes they go back to an idea which was like three or four generation old uh, in the organization and i'll talk about one very interesting example there when i when i get to that that how uh, uh, just because you have a shinier tool today does not make everything else that was done in the past kind of uh, you know void and 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 lastly i think this is one place which you i mean I, i would like to believe that the audience today has a lot of people who are uh, who have made that switch or are in the process of making that switch to pick data science as a core expertise um it is uh, unlike a lot of other functions it's at a very very important uh, crossroad in an organization and what i mean by that is think about how technology has evolved in the last three or four decades uh it started first uh, at the back end but today it's almost like the engine that drives the organization similarly data science started at the back end of the organization where we were trying to build feeder lines of information and insight but increasingly it's becoming extremely extremely you know uh, what i call uh, a collaborative function where uh, the need to understand the rest of the organization engage with the rest of the organization very 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 high so as you think about some of the problems that i will kind of uh, relay uh, feel free i i, I don't know uh, it's been a while since i did a session like this um uh, i prefer interactivity so uh, i have a question kind of a thing is a good thing to stop me and and to mix because that's what i would like to have um now before i get into uh, you know the problems itself and where i would invite ideas and suggestions is um, in the uh, the the one thing that i think everyone here uh, in this audience and otherwise you know the larger uh, pool of data scientists that i meet are reasonably good at the uh, data deconstruction and what i call the quantitative or slash mathematical deconstruction uh, or one of the two there is a reasonably larger pool actually which is on a very good at the third pool today so interestingly 9 out of 10 interviews that i have with potential you know candidates and stuff um if i ask them what did you do uh, to solve let's say a risk problem or what did you do to solve a particular harm detection problem they will be very quick to tell me what model what library of uh, in, in python did they use what tool did they use but the one place where you know most of them would falter is if i ask them why did you use it and uh, uh, it, it's it's almost heartbreaking at that point in time because it it seems like uh, uh, we have been told something that we think is the only answer available so example of that that the most prominent example for people of my generation is if you ask people how would you build a a uh, risk scorecard i mean a, a risk model or a model for underwriting customers uh, everyone would answer the same way uh, we'll build a logistic regression model why uh, because the you know the the second filter of the people will be people who say because the outcome is binary it's a one zero problem so logistic regression is a good thing to do oh sure but uh, the outcome that you are looking at is a probability of default is there any other model you can use for a probability of default uh, and then the whole lot would go silent at that point in time and uh, if you would ask them to construct the problem of default as not a one zero problem but a scale problem because a default of 50 lakhs is not the same thing as a default of 5000 rupees then people will automatically sometimes switch over to making it a linear uh, regression problem or some kind of a distribution oriented problem and then you would again kind of probe them a little further and they'll like ah this is too complicated i don't want to do this um uh, this is like why are you asking me out of out of syllabus questions right so the 
the the big idea that I, I'm kind of trying to keep you know coming back to is the first two, the business deconstruction and problem deconstruction. That's where differentiation of your skill comes. Because if you understand the problem, if you understand what you're solving for and how it really adds value to the business that you're working on or working with, then other three become actually quite easy after that. But if you do not care about the first two, you get married to the uh, one of the other three or you know two of the other three. So I have met data scientists who are very, very focused that they essentially only want to work on ML problems. And when you ask them, what will you use the ML for? Then they're like, I don't care. I just want to use ML because that's what being a data scientist means, not dealing with data day in and day out, right? So just balance out your skills as you think about the problems that are going to come in now. So enough of that lecture. Uh, but I personally believe that uh, the best data folks, analysts, data scientists that I have worked with, worked for, worked under, supervised, they have a very, very solid balance of these five problems. And uh, I'll take a case study or an example next to kind of drive that point home. Uh, let's safely assume that all of you know e-commerce reasonably well. You know what Amazon is, you know what uh, Flipkart is, you know what they do, you know, hopefully you know how they make money. But, uh, one of the biggest problems that they face is the what you see as an example on the right side, right? People call them and they say that uh, instead of sending me a phone, you sent me a brick. Uh, and then they have to kind of take it back. They have to uh, send a new phone. They have to do an entire process around verification of the customer. And what most people don't know is that that loss because of all of this can be as high as 24 to 25% of what is called the GMV. Now, if you are Amazon, or if you are Flipkart, or if you are Snapdeal, you'd be extremely worried about the problem. But you have to balance it out against what is... Uh, so if you start denying people that I won't let you buy all the time because of the slightest doubt that you have, then your GMV will drop. If your GMV will drop, your valuation will drop. But if you allow everyone to do whatever they are doing, then the amount of fraud in the system is very high because for what it's worth, if I were to ask you, why wouldn't why wouldn't Amazon actually send you a break, right? Amazon would not send you a break. So some seller would have said, sent you a break. The seller also has no interest in sending you a break because by the second rating, you lose all possibilities of um, having a recurring business, which is like the seller is essentially a pawn. But sellers are a lot more traceable because they have to upload their GSTs, they have to upload their documents. Uh, so the, the, the fraud actually happens somewhere in the chain. Either the delivery person has decided to do something funny, uh, logistic process has not been very prudent, or the customer who bought it figured out a way to kind of game the system and send you back a break. Now the question, if you were kind of stuck at the middle of this problem, right? You are the analytics team, which is trying to balance out this idea of uh, how do I measure fraud? Or how do I identify potential fraudsters? Uh, what kind of data would I need? What kind of models would I build? How would I identify these fraudsters, put a score on them, put a tag on their head, not allow them to come back into the system through a second gate? How would you even go about approaching this problem? Where would you begin? Anyone, any ideas? You can type it out, you can voice it out. Anyone? Sir, uh, Shrikant here. Go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, as there are uh, uh, n number of sellers who are uh, online for a particular product, mm -hmm. okay, there is also a way we can have a rating of that uh, sellers. Mm -hmm. Okay, like the same we have at Zomato and Swiggy, the uh, rating of the delivery boy, rating of the person who delivers it, the sellers and all that. So that might be helpful to find out the past history of that seller. So that would be useful. And that's a problem that is solved by asking you to rate the product, rate right? The, uh, the transaction. The seller for the transaction, the delivery person, and right. all that aspects. Right? So you're saying that the rating of the delivery person, rating of the seller, and rating of uh, the transaction itself, there are these three ratings possible, right? 
So Amit store selling OnePlus phone can be rated for Amit store or can be also rated for just that transaction that this shop is good, but not really good for OnePlus. And the agent who delivers can be rated for logistics. Is, is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, absolutely, sir. And do you think people, wh what would be your hypothesis about how many people are okay with giving these ratings? Sir, uh, hypothesis, uh, if you go, on, go ahead and set a hypothesis, uh, would be uh, like, uh, uh, So we can actually go ahead and ask have multiple questions into our rating. So that would uh, uh, be helpful. As a customer, do you enjoy giving, filling out those? Uh, if you are, uh, if you are a customer who's bought this. I think single click, single click ratings are very easy. Like if you don't ask for forms, if you just ask for uh, just a rating mm -hmm. without a comment. I mean, I rate every purchase for delivery yes, as sir. well as product. So you're because forcing nowadays, is it just as a curiosity question? Uh, I, I miss who said, but you are asking, forcing the customers to rate everything, right? On a single pop. Not force, not force. It's optional. Right. I mean, if you want it's to right. rate, you rate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, very interestingly, all of you are talking about a post facto check, right? Because the delivery has to happen. Yes, but, but the question which you asked, how to stop the second gate? For that, well, this won't help. That is one of the questions. If you can stop at the first gate, that means you have minimized the losses significantly. Second gate is you have run some losses. And it would seem that you're assuming that the logistics guy is the bigger problem than the customer himself or herself. Is that so? So I'll throw a third spanner in the mix. The third spanner in the mix is when you get to analyzing it, maybe you'll find that uh, there's a collusion also that happens. So Amit is the delivery agent in, let's say XYZ area of Noida, right? So a lot of Amazon packets are delivered by Amit himself in that area. And by the look and the feel and the size and the shape of the box, he kind of knows these are the cell phone boxes. And hence, Amit also has a set of customers in that region who are really good at running the system. So they, coll they collude and they do it. So that's the third angle to it. There's some value to that also. Anyone wants to now react to that as a problem? We can so have... Uh... Pictures taken at two points. One at the packing. So before packing, there is one, one photo taken. Um, okay. Any other ideas? So, Mohit here. Yeah. Uh, so, like in this whole process, I believe there are like multiple touch points to be addressed. Then, because firstly, it would be the seller. Then, there's the whole process from where the seller is shipping it to the customer. And then it reaches the customer. So, there are in that process itself, between there is the delivery person. So there are at least four places where the fraud could happen. So let's say considering the time taken at each step for a certain category of a product, because mm -hmm. suppose it's a mobile phone, those are generally delivered to most places within two days. So you would want to consider like how much time is it actually being taken for that particular product to be delivered on an average, mm -hmm. or let's say if it is some other product like a washing machine it might take a little longer right so to understand on what end is it happening you would want to consider the time taken at each step let's say on the seller's end on the delivery end on the supply chain end or on the customer's end like if customer let's say reports it a week later it might happen that the customer hasn't opened it but then or if there's a change in mind of the customer that he doesn't want that product but then he still wants to return it and or maybe make some money off of it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of it to be considered that you would want to see. Like check up on that. Interesting set of points. Uh, I also see in the chat some points about uh, uh, 
collect data about category of product that have been fraudulent, map the geographic location, mean time to deliver a variance, control points such as warehouse delivery collections, and uh, the considering the time taken for different steps in the process. Mohit, I think you highlighted that just now. Yes, sir. Uh, well before all of this, now this is where now I'll get into the a little bit of the preach mode. Um, well before all of this, let's say I'm starting, I my, my starting baseline was that it's a 26% problem of GMV. So there is either a customer concentration or a revenue concentration that is happening, right? Of, of sorts. It's it's too large a number. So the first point is to understand what's what as a product, what as a region, what as a category, what as a delivery partner, what is a set of delivery agents, um, broader geography, everything that you guys said, right? Which step of the chain, which part is actually contributing the error the most, right? If if you can point that, then it will be too easy a problem to solve, right? Because X percent of the problem is because region A is creating problems. And the manifestation of that is a simple rule. You don't need a sophisticated model to solve for that problem. How did Amazon solve for it or Flipkart solve for it? They said no COD is allowed in sector something of uh, Noida. There was a point where if you somehow, you know, as a very respectable gentleman or lady, you, you chose to stay in that sector, you realize that your uh, checkout process did not have a COD option. You had to prepay the order. That gives you more time to solve the problem logistically. It still does not solve the problem because I can pay and I can still replace the phone with a brick. Um, then they started the second approach to the problem, which is where the industry of the problem changed. What do I mean by that? Instead of looking at an e-commerce problem, they turned it into an insurance problem. So they started working with insurance companies to pay a premium so that these can be underwritten. What percentage of their losses can be recovered? And then they started the third layer, which was with the partner uh, penalties. Because logistics, there are two versions. One is when your own logistic uh, crew takes care of it, uh, versus when you have third party delivery companies like Delivery, Ship Rocket, and so on. So they started penalty contributions around that. But none of this really addressed the problem of onboarding fraudulent customers and which required them to build a fraud model separately. Now, fraud models are, if, if you guys have been somewhat exposed to it, they are complex modeling problems, right? Because you are trying to build essentially a customer based on very minimal data points at the time of onboarding, a likelihood of the person being fraud and thereby deciding what kind of customer journeys they will have. And again, as an analytics person, I would solve it differently as an analytic person who's aware of the technology complexity, I would like to also understand that any solution that I build, now think about how many, at, at the big billion day sale, uh, they have about 6,000 orders per minute. So which one of you can imagine the load that the infra goes through for running 6,000 fraud checks every minute? as a separate process, as against all the infra load that is being used to manage, check out. So what you want is a very, very simplified set of rules, not a very, very complex uh, ML model, which is factoring in, you know, three years of data across all customers to identify what happened to the addresses, which of these addresses are, you know, in about 50 uh, meter radius of the address that has defaulted three times in the last three months, kind of rules. That's where the problem that you see becomes a blown up problem that while in the classroom, we used to solve over a 20 slide presentation with a small data set. It becomes this five year long problem that Amazon took to bring down that number from 26% to 13%. And after the 13% number, the analytic guy raised his hand and said, Bus, beyond this, I cannot bring it down unless you give me control over the customer journey. And that's where you see your work come to life. So that's one, just one example of, you know, every idea that you guys touched upon was happening as a second gate problem. The first gate problem is where I would have already incurred 50 to 60% of my losses. 
because if I'm a true fraud, and now you have to think like a, a fraud for a minute, then I would actually not want to use the same ID multiple times over. And everything else is easy. So instead of calling the address as uh, 101 Rahija Vihar, I would call it 102 Rahija Vihar, right? Now, the moment I have done 102, every agent around that time would be calling me before delivering. Can I deliver it to you now? And I would say, just wait there. I'll come down and pick it up from you. I have just stepped out. So the 101 to 102 difference is so easy to manage if you are a true fraud, right? There are several areas that are not as you know micro uh, addressed as uh, we would like them to be. And that makes fraud very, very easy. Uh, one of the oldest case studies in India is uh, this debate around um, credit cards were not issued in for an address which was in the Dharavi region of uh, Bombay. And it has a two-pronged problem. One is it sends a very negative message to the market, right? That I'm discriminating against a particular area or a population. On the other hand, the bank's risk team was very clear that the corrections and recovery rate in that particular area are extremely low. But I'm penalizing the 10 good guys who might be there also in that same brush. Is that fair or not? So that's the balance between fraud versus GMB. And that's a, you know, uh, this the, the first leg problem, that fraud problem that I'm, I'm talking about, when you guys get into analyzing uh, it across industries, you will notice that it has elements of uh, your classical CNN models, if you will, versus very simple heuristics. And when a company like Visa did it, the heuristic delivered the first 80% of the value and the, uh, the models delivered the last 20% of the value because that was used only after, you know, uh, the, the, the neural nets basically delivered the last 20% of the value, value which is important, but you still have to deal with the 80% first to get that right. Um, another example is... Uh, Sorry, and I'll change the context because this is the other thing that I see people struggling with. E-commerce is a space that you all understand, but uh, do all of you equally well understand, let's say an industry like uh, telecom in the early 2000, uh, when uh, plans were expensive and people had dial-up connections, late 90s and early 2000, people had dial-up connections, which were extremely bad. And uh, we had a client, and I'm, I'm, these are all basically live case studies and from my life. Um, we had a client which basically had this problem of people were calling in to cancel uh, their plan, saying that we don't like your plan. And the agent uh, you know, uh, is uh, somebody who's uh, trying to retain the customer. So everyone who's worked on, uh, if any of you are exposed to call centers, there are these retention queues that you have. So when a customer calls in to say, I don't want, I want to cancel my credit card, I want to cancel my phone connection. There's somebody, you know, desperately tries to save you, they make it very difficult for you to cancel. Now in this client's case, they had additional incentives for people signing up for a different plan. So if you try to convince the customer by saying, you know, uh, if you switch to a different plan, I will bring down the rate and whatever, whatever. So what they realized, now this is where they turned it into a uh, modeling problem for us. Um, what they were struggling with is that the agents would, the retention agents would bring in about 75% retention. So 100 people that would call in to cancel, 75 to 77 would be retained by these customers. All these customers, of the 75% customers, only about 9% customers eventually activated their account. Because you still had to go in um, and uh, kind of click a couple of things and say, I agree, et cetera, et cetera, download a dialer software, which was new, and activate. Now, the first thing that you have to kind of mentally recalibrate is what was that industry and what was the time like? Um, because we are very, very fixated to the industries that we understand. And when we have to change our guard, we, we struggle, but it doesn't take a lot of time if, if you just recalibrate yourself a little bit. In that context, they wanted us to, the moment a customer is retained uh, as per the agent, they wanted us to model what was the likelihood that the customer will actually activate. Because then they would only spend the marketing dollars, the post kind of call marketing dollars on that person. And that would essentially mean about a 50% reduction in marketing spend. 
how would you know any ideas how would you start even breaking down the problem anyone wants to take a stab at it no thoughts so more there go on man so this take over here as well i would like to take a similar approach to the previous problem like the main reason would be people were not as tech focused in that era let's say so and things weren't as advanced so the main idea would have been to get things hassle free so it more feels like an optimization problem mm -hmm. than to even model for uh, let's say the dropout rate in that sense so okay. uh like if we this is similar to how we would want to get a feedback from a certain customer mm -hmm. like in general cases we give an option to a customer to give a feedback in almost like every product we're selling but then only let's say 10 to 15% of the people actually give us a feedback mm -hmm. so we would want to even if the offer is pretty let's say decent in terms of what they were already getting they the sign up process if it is more hassle free i would believe that this would create like a better uh, chance of the customer staying back so one of your hypothesis would be that the process has to be a little more seamless yes sir okay any other hypothesis from anyone else all right so let's take it from the top customer calls in to cancel right uh customer calls in to cancel because they are unhappy because they think the plan is an expensive or because they think the plan is absolutely crap or the they are happy with it but they are just moving to a different location or whatever right there is a reason for cancellation so let's say if you are extremely unhappy with what the what you are getting today you know uh, someone had to joke about uh, uh, telecom connections right cell phone connections that these days we make most of the calls on whatsapp because cell phone towers to barely work but the point is in one of those scenarios where you call in to cancel your cell phone connection saying that i am porting over from airtel to vodafone or vodafone to airtel and vodafone guy says you know instead of your 299 uh, per month plan i'll give you a 199 plan please switch how likely are you to switch i would venture to say that most of the people there would not be very keen just because you are offering a cheaper plan uh because the problem lies elsewhere so that's one uh that's the top level you know the reason of cancellation is one now it seems that whatever is happening across regions that 75% retention is still happening at the agent level that they are able to save the uh, customer from cancelling and opting for a different plan and uh, the cynic in me says is that really true how does the process of retention work so what data will i analyze for that i will analyze the data the call transcripts from a call center so i'm looking for calls where the customer has called in to be broadly speaking and happy so if i draw, draw some kind of a um, one of the things that you all have to be extremely comfortable with is this is this idea of me see right mutually exclusive collectively exhaustive um mece when you're breaking a problem down there is a broader me see framework now the analysis population for us is this customer base which is calling in to cancel uh the first a uh, port of call is that yes i'm calling into cancel so i press one and i get connected to a agent the agent is the second port of call where i say okay 75% are being saved i don't trust the number maybe or i want to reanalyze the number so i get into the call that happened between the agent and the customer this universe is an nlp universe right so you are looking at transcripts 
Uh, you are looking at keywords. You are looking at points of intervention. You are looking at duration of calls, uh, and you are looking at this broader sentiment kind of uh, analysis to say that the overall sentiment of the call was. We conducted. We, we took out a sample of. Back then, we used to do it with samples. We took out a sample of ten thousand calls or five thousand calls and uh, cancellation calls. And guess what? Um, most of them, the broader sentiment of the call is negative. The customer is not happy at the beginning, at the middle, at the end. So how are we getting uh, the seventy-five percent retention? So we had to overlay something else from somewhere else as data, which was to understand what was the incentive of the process. So the incentive of the process was that you know the the, the call center agent gets whatever fourteen dollars an hour, twenty dollars an hour kind of a salary. But the person also gets another fifteen dollars every time they save a customer. Wow, which, which means if I save a customer, I almost get one hour worth of pay. Awesome. Then you say, how do we know that the agent has saved the customer? So they have to kind of do two or three things. They have to get the customer to say yes, or they have to send out this email which says the customer has accepted, and they send out this mail for activating the link. Now, in a system where there is no official record of the customer saying yes, you could send out an email even without the customer actually having said yes. And the way you structure the incentive decides the way people deal with the process. So a lot of the agents were essentially pushing the buttons. Can you please? Can you please? Can you please? Can you please? You know, you should try it out. I will just send you the link. You don't have to do anything. I'm just sending you a link. Take a look at it. Activate it if you like it. It's a much better plan. You don't have to do anything. Send the link. The customer thinks they're just getting a link, which they ignore, which they delete. Nothing happens. And uh, uh, the business side believes that these certain customers were saved. Now this is an agent abuse. And then you get to the third problem, which is the agent actually was right. Let's say forty percent of the cases people could be retained by giving them a cheaper plan because they had cost concerns. Uh, then you start getting into what happens when the customer gets that note, that email. Guess what? Eighteen percent of the time, it gets qualified as spam, which is a delivery issue. Of the seventy-two percent cases that uh, are getting delivered, and people let's say start uh, the process, um, the file has a twenty-two MB download. And back in the days, whoever used internet back then can tell you that twenty-two MB download over a dial-up connection back then was a nightmare. Uh, so it would take 20 minutes to download chances are that something would go wrong in that window so you would cancel the download and never get to it what's the, what what's the percentage of the customer facing that problem let's say another 25% or 28% or something then you are left with people who actually download and install it and try to use it now this is where something extremely funny was happening if you knew um, if, if you know your way around technology logs now this is data that most data scientists don't used to much if you understand your way around uh, application logs and so on and so forth you realized that of these people a lot of them were essentially not going beyond what was considered to be a 22% completion of the process and for our life we could not figure out what was going wrong the thing that was going wrong is that in the application build there was this big bulk file and the way uh, the installation process would appear to you is you're at one, two, three, four, five, six, 22%, and then it will get stuck at 22% because a big file is getting copied and configured. And when you complete that part, it suddenly jumps from 22 to 65%. But the screen is stuck at 22% for a while. So people would think, oh, something has gone wrong, and they would just stop the process and restart again. Now, this, if you think about it from a data perspective, it required us to kind of go through a variety of places there was the call center data there was the customer data there was the, the actual transcript there was the server logs there was the tech logs application logs that were being sent over the internet all of it brought over uh, over a, uh, and and when you kind of break it down into some kind of a chain tree you start understanding which part of the model is significant which part of the tree is significant which part is not and then what are the problems that we are really trying to model because we cannot model for agents abuse right that's an incentive problem we're essentially only modeling for 75% of the cases where uh, people were ready to explore, but could not close it out. 
And there again, this, this whole 22% to 62% pi problem is not a model problem. It's a rebuild of the application installation process, which you know any analytics team cannot complain, but you know can, can cannot change. But we'll always be blamed about to have missed it. So again, the point I was trying to address was, you know, your model was actually your only a 25% population uh, or a 30% population problem. But if you bring in all 100% of the data to solve this problem, you'll get a very, very spurious set of results. So this is a classical case of how you first segment the population before you build models for different segments independently. And each of the models has a very different construct. Each of the models has a very different design and a very different data set availability. So you solve it slightly differently. Now, in the interest of time, I'll not uh, try to go as deep into uh, a lot of the other cases. I'll tell you what was the fun thing and what was the differentiation here. This is an example of how if you as the data science team is working on a product launch and you have to establish whether the product is a success and hence the marketing team should put more money into it. The product we are analyzing was Diet Pepsi Max. Um, uh, and we are trying to understand through the, through the launch markets uh, in a few parts of, uh, in a few cities of US. Uh, the, the initial problem, the way it was set up was adoption curves problem, right? How was the sales kind of starting from point A to point B? But by the time we got to the data and what, by the time we kind of actually broke down the problem, it became a three-part problem. Uh, yes, adoption curve, but within the adoption curve, every time you create demand, you have to ensure that one of two things is happening, which is the issue of product availability on the shelf. So let's say I run a big media campaign around Diet Pepsi Max, then my people show up at the store and they realize that the store does not have any Diet Pepsi Max. It happens once, it happens twice, it happens thrice. By the fourth time, I'm not interested in buying the product. Now I have completely lost that part of the demand uh, and its analysis into my model. If I don't understand what the field phenomena looks like in this case, if I start with just looking at the adoption curves and every market will have its own different adoption curve, so to speak, in some cases, I will see a very weird drop that is happening in demand. And that demand has nothing to do with the latent demand for the product, but the availability on the shelf. So out of X stores that we visited, the first 10, seven had stock outs when we went to the store. And we said, if there is no nothing on the on the shelf, how do you expect anyone to buy it? And how do you expect me to model the demand of the product, right? So that, that, that's another example of it. Uh, this example is two sort tricks. So I'll have to explain the context of the dental products market. It's a very different space, so I'll, I'll leave it. I, I'll touch upon this because it's very close to my heart these days. Um, financial inclusion in India is, a, uh, and many developing countries is a huge problem. Um, and invariably, it boils down to two things. Uh, it either boils down to uh, um, the idea of trust, uh, whether I have enough data to trust this customer base, or B, uh, the cost to serve this base. That's why most of the larger corporates, capitalist heavy institutions do not like touching the segment very easily. And the governments have to run policy programs or they have to run priority sector partnership focused programs to address this. One of the reasons why we built out Algo 360 was to kind of hit at this problem. Um, now, the philosophical aspects of the problem aside, one of the changes that has happened in the industry in the last 10 years in a very, very distinct way is uh, the idea of smartphone and internet adoption. And that's a global phenomenon at, at this point in time. Whichever country you travel, you can buy SIM cards at the airport, even if you go to the real rural areas, you get internet uh, connections. Now, the question that I may have for you is, what is that data? What is this trend got to do with the two problems that we talked about, right? The trust and the cost to serve these customers. And when you start looking at it, this is a classical case of A, the data is immense. It's unstructured because... If you think about the amount of data your phone generates, stores, processes on a given day, uh, most of the people in this class will be consuming about a gig or more, right? Then you're consuming a gig and more. The amount of post-processing that can be done out of it will make it a few times over. It's streaming all the time. It contains a mixture of uh, what I call behavioral attributes. It, it, it talks about who you are. It talks about your preferences and choices. It talks about your financials. It talks about your social network. It talks about 
your social community and what place you hold in that community. It it talks about uh, your broader, I would call it, uh, personal patterns that affect the universe of risk and underwriting and so on and so forth. Uh, it, you can actually go a lot basic than that and say that uh, the device that you carry tells me a little bit about you. So the people who carry an iPhone 13 who have just migrated from iPhone 12 are a different breed than the person who's using a OnePlus phone for the last five years is different than the person who uses a smartphone, which is very, very entry-level model and so on and so forth. Huge amounts of data. Problem is how do you define whether you trust this person or not based on what you have in their hand as a device? Suggestions, ideas, what kind of hypothesis will you build? How will you deconstruct that problem? What does trust mean to you in the financial sense? Uh, so like, the more expensive device. Sorry, you go ahead. Go ahead. I'll go second. Was it Prasad who was talking? Sorry. Yes, I, I started, but I think somebody else also. Uh, go ahead. You can make the point. I think they can go second. Then. Okay. Like um, uh, a basic thing, what happens is if you go to some, if you're searching for airline tickets on a MacBook, same airline tickets if you search on Windows. There's a price difference which you get mm -hmm. on the same side. Mm -hmm. So the more expensive device, the uh, company already knows that you are financially well. Okay. And I have tested that on, on hotel sites and airline sites on Windows as well as Mac. And there is a difference. You're talking about a very privileged section. The person that can actually buy an expensive device is really not the problem of financial inclusion, right? Yes, but the Are device they? that person holds will yeah. let you know the financial stability. Right. Okay. What's your view on the second hand uh, devices? It is still, uh, if you buy a second-hand iPhone, it is still iPhone. So I would still consider you as, as that segment customer. And what would you, because the world is not in black and white, what would you think of a person who earns 20,000 a month and decides to spend 20,000, may say 18,000 on buying a second-hand iPhone? Because it's a status symbol. If the device is the only thing which you want to identify the customer from, then you have to consider that customer as, I mean, unless you have that salary data. I mean, you know, there are apps we can, which can read SMSs. And, mm -hmm. you know, once you give access to SMS, the salary SMS also comes from the same. Thing. And most apps actually know your bank balance and your salary. Which automatically means that the device is not sufficient. There's a context to the device, correct? Correct, but but the first, um, like first opinion about a person mm -hmm. is the device that person holds, right? If you don't know whether it is secondhand, whether it is new, mm -hmm. whether it is old, five years old, or how much salary that person has. Um, somebody is using Mac, mm -hmm. of course they have, they are higher than others, right? Not everybody just votes for Mac because. Even if there the is a lot is of available. difference between between Windows and if they are customers like that. So, okay, so that's one set of hypotheses that you can look at the nature of the device and try to find something. What else? We are talking about trust here more than affluence. So, I mean, the, the more expensive the device is, you know that you the person, person has better better financial. The more financially affluent the person is, does that mean that you will trust the person more? You cannot trust based on how much money that has. I mean, <laughs> the question has is trust. The question is money. not yet at the point of how do I establish their earning potential. Um, the question is about trust. That trust. if I give, for example, all of you who uh, and some of you might be in the same class, etc. If I were to run a general thought experiment saying if all of them back to back come back, come to you and ask you for 500 bucks, 
how many of them do you trust that they will return it by tomorrow morning you would say pretty much all of them if you know them right all of them yeah pretty much all of them will should return it i think i know them enough but there might just be that one person that would say mm, this person is not going to give it back he'll forget i'll have to remind him not that he has a financial problem is just too forgetful he'll forget and not return back and then i have to remind him again tomorrow morning which is such a hassle so let me not give it to him and there's a reason why i i specifically chose that example uh, in that sense and then there's a third person that you would say this person is basically you know back in my school or college i was said this person if he's asking money uh, he's asking to get drunk and i will not fund that thing or this person i already know that he has already taken 500 bucks from four other people all of them have not got their money back who am i to get the money back these are four segments in risk by the way uh, so i'll come back to it but you relate to all of you relate to that example yes sir yes, so 80% 85% 90% some people you trust right but you are trusting them not on the basis of their affluence correct yes sir okay this is the difference between what is called ability to pay and willingness to pay in the world of risk um so ability to pay might be high for a person who carries an iphone that does not mean that the person carries the same willingness to pay and willingness to pay is a very fluid concept uh, and so is the ability to pay uh, pay so ability to pay the fluidity comes from the person who's carrying an iphone is more affluent for sure has more ability to pay for sure but if i were to give a loan of a crore to a person who carries an iphone on the basis of them carrying an iphone i don't think i'm doing enough of an assessment right at that point their ability to pay has gone to their ability to pay an emi of 1 lakh per month may not be there just because they are using an iphone right because they bought it on emi generally they are on a decent enough income whatever segment etc so the ability of pay to pay essentially is a contextual uh, thing depending on you know what you decide as the loan amount and stuff but willingness to pay is a far trickier concept uh and that's the notion of trying to understand what is the risk that i associate with paying this person now the, going back to the example the first example i will give it to this person the second person i will not give to this person because this i'll have to just remind him again tomorrow morning i find it to be a hassle that is a very very small segment within digital lending so sometimes you want to create products like these bnpls etc etc if you have to call the person thrice to collect the money you are already in losses because there's hardly any money to be made in those products so i would rather not give it to customers that i will have to remind thrice before they will pay even though the ticket size is probably just 1000 bucks the fact that i'm really not making any money on them the three three times reminder makes my pnl look bad so i want to model the people who will do a one click payment versus the people who won't do one click payments the third example i gave is i did not want to give it to him because he's got basically got a uh, he's going to go, go down and get drunk now that example comes from the purpose of the loan that you are giving so for somebody for example and this is this is a, a, you know in my universe it's a fascinating problem maybe not for you guys um would you give somebody a medical loan so their their family member is in the hospital they are dealing with a very expensive treatment like like what happened in the first phase of covid their expenses are running to 10 and 20 lakhs the person has all the desire to pay they have all the willingness to pay maybe their ability to pay is x or y um what is the one thing that drives the portfolio per performance of such a loan unfortunately it's death so how do you model the risk it is the category of catastrophic risk right when i'm dealing with that's why insurance is priced differently that's why you know comorbidities are priced differently and so on and so forth it's such a you know tearing kind of a two ends uh, problem so you are trying to understand the difference between yes the need is there the person has a certain repayment capacity the repayment capacity by the way is a function of the person actually becoming better in a certain duration of time and thereby going back to a job where they can continue to earn the same amount of money how do i model that phenomena it's very difficult to do but what i do know this is the most complex example the simplest example is 
who am i okay with giving a vacation loan to who am i going okay with giving a wedding loan to and who am i okay with giving a loan for buying a scooter to a bike to the loan for a bike is an easy loan because the bike is a revenue generating asset for somebody who drives around on a for delivering stuff for swiggy now it's a not a personal vehicle it's a commercial vehicle which is being used as a personal vehicle so the repayment capacity is linked to the use of the bike right but it's also a secured asset that i can repossess and thereby i collect some of the money back so once you start understanding the purpose of what is going to happen with this 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 flow of money that we are talking about you start understanding the difference between institutions which are microfinance institutions which are unsecured lending institutions which are uh giving loans for tractors versus institutions which are giving loans to bikes and so on and so forth and then you start understanding why they are so different from each other in the way they collect data in the way they model the data in the way they use the data and um, that 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 you know kind of is is where we were looking at trying to make a change and and for us there is the business complexity of it which comes from the example that we are discussing and there's a huge amount of data complexity so for example uh till date we have to process like somebody mentioned sms right the 45 billion messages that we have passed through our ringer and we realize that only 24 billion of them are usable we understand that there is no point building a model on 24 billion messages so we only use about 35 million of them um uh, to kind of build and run the model but 35 million is also not a small amount so how do you build a model that kind of trains and retrains itself over you know iterations to keep my understanding of risk same in a world where the data changes every 30 minutes and to give you an example of 30 minutes is if i am in a need of loan and i download one of the lending apps right now and i get a loan uh for it versus i download an app i get rejected and in the next 20 minutes i download 10 other apps the 10th app is taking a far greater risk than the second app and i want you guys to think about that as a problem as to why the risk has increased with every incremental reject that this person was amit das has already gone through and how that information that was generated in the last 29 minutes is relevant to the last guy who will decide to give a loan so on that note i'll pause and uh, you know it's 5 o'clock but uh, i had a bunch of other examples which are around misinformation privacy versus you know uh the kind of delight that let's say a platform like facebook tries to create by giving you personalized feeds the amount of information that they have access to but they can also be used as a negative trigger for spreading misinformation by some groups how do you model rare events uh it's easy to model events which are happening at scale it's very difficult to model events that happen rarely uh so for example certain classes of diseases equipment shutdowns every time that happens the cost is immense but they happen very rarely so you do not get enough information about what caused the the bad event so how do you take those examples and build models in those scenarios and so on and so forth i think a pause happy to answer any questions that the crew has uh, or offline also hello sir so actually a lot of uh, more of business insights like we got from the thing and lot to digest actually because lot of things we are not aware that what happens behind uh, actually building a risk model or something we got some just from whatever you told and what on all uh, diverse uh, ways we have to think to actually build a risk model but okay. just on a uh, summary note i want to ask like uh, uh, generally uh, for the present market scenario for the risk models how efficient are there uh, when compared to the previous uh, rule based models how how much we are adding value uh, through modeling because as you told for many of the problems we can't actually build models which can assess like a big billion sale the like you said so mm-hmm. what is uh, that we are adding value through purely from a, a data science modeling point of view so my broad belief is that in the next 10 years to 15 years every company will become a data company uh that's large company uh because the value that almost all good analytics teams are bringing to their respective organizations right now is immense so to give you examples which are very very tangible uh the difference between if if we work with 70 plus financial institutions uh today the difference between the best and the worst on their npa rates for example 
is something like uh, the, the worst guy has a 20% default rate, the best guy has 1.3. 1.3. And that is largely credit to how well they use their data and how good their models are. Uh, so the difference of that 18% that I talked about, if you think about it in terms of portfolios of a million dollars or a billion dollars, you can start understanding what is the tangible impact that they make. The second part is about um, getting a little technical uh, is that almost all, uh, wherever you see very, very complex models in place, right? And, and the best example and relatable example that I can think of is a driverless car, uh, which is probably a suite of over a million different models at this point in time. Um, but when you think about it, at the basic, when it was designed, it was first a million different heuristics or rules, simple rules. Object detected, stop kind of rules, right? Not object detected at 30 meters or 50 meters or 70 meters, the speed of the car is 30 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour. Brake efficiency is this, need to maintain a six feet distance by the time the car comes to stop. So it'll be a sudden brake or a you know gradual brake, whatever it is. When you think break down the scenario, what they started with was very, very basic set of heuristics. And that's how risk universe also works. All companies, whether it is SDFC, ICICI, whether it is NBFCs like Alpha Finance, whether it is FinTechs like Bharat Pay and Navi and all those guys, everyone has started their journey based on very simple ratings or heuristic or rule-based frameworks. What difference that we are seeing right now is, for example, an SDFC would have taken two years to move from heuristics to models. A Navi, because of the amount of data that they collect, for instance, at the beginning, and they're also more modern, uh, would move from heuristic to model within three months. And in the next six months, they would have in the UAT environments, not in the production, because that has a different level of regulatory complexity. Um, they would have ML models informing whether they can switch from base quant models like regressions, et cetera, to a purely ML model. So one of the things uh, going back to that Pepsi example was one of the things we did ages back was what was called demand forecasting. But it's such a comp everyone that you'll talk to, and I'm sure in your studies you would have come across, demand forecasting is a time series model. Everyone will tell you. But to build a demand forecasting suite for a company like Pepsi, you have to build not one model, but essentially you are running a family of 5,000 models, each of which is assessing every SKU every day to say which model fits better. And that's the one that is used for the next set of forecasts. Why? Because the demand ebb and flow changes. In holiday seasons, it's different. In summer, it's different. In winters, it's different. Uh, the demand for chips is different. The demand for 300 ml bottles is different. The demand for two liter bottles is different. Everything is unique. So that's the, that's the value that a data science practitioner brings to the table by saying, you know, let's get away from these. Let's, let's start with the baseline, which is rule-based, but let's get to these complex models, which by the way, will give you easy 5, 10, 15, 20, 30% lift in your profitability uh, if you do it really well. And that number, 20, 30% is a contextual number because some portfolios are designed to be highly capital efficient versus not but extreme value. And it, it is one of the industries, not because I'm here, but it's, all, it, it's a broader generalized belief across US and India where we work that almost all companies are turning into data and data science companies. And that's why you see such huge investments in, uh, I struggle to keep track of the innovation that is happening. Yesterday I met two companies, one was called Sigma Computing, one was called DBT, and you guys need to check them out. Sigma is basically uh, turning Excel into a big data application. Their, their play is that you can run a billion rows on a cloud stack, but you get the flexibility of a Microsoft Excel on cloud, right? On a billion uh, rows and unstructured data, data database. So a lot of fascinating stuff happening. Long answer to the short question. Uh, yes, sir. And one more question, like, uh... Uh, in the risk modeling, suppose uh, suppose we have constructed a model and maybe it is adding some bias because of some regional or how do we take care of any biases which we don't want but actually bringing because of the model is taking uh, is is uh, trained on some specific uh, uh, data. 
So, so one of the things that helps you is uh, what we refer to as PSI, Population Stability Index. Uh, so let's say you build a model today based on some population assumptions and accidentally you introduce a bias, right? Yeah. Um, in one month, two months, three months, four months, what that bias means is that your decision making has started shifting your portfolio towards that bias. Example of that as quoted in the US is the discrimination against black population. Nobody claimed it, but that, that, that inherent bias kind of led to, when you would look at the data set, your data set would no longer resemble what you were working with when you decided to build the model. So your population stability would have shifted. So PSI is a very, very common metric used for assessing whether my operations, business operations, or my model has introduced a bias in the mix. Okay. But at any point, I mean, it's a general suggestion that uh, uh, if you ever deploy models, put model monitoring frameworks in place, and one of the things that they should always do is keep checking for the shift in population mix. So that classical, you know, t-tests of comparing samples, those kind of things are absolutely essential. Uh, Amit, I have one question about the outliers. Mm -hmm. So when we generally build models, we we like most of the time we remove outliers, thinking that it's a small population. But in cases of lone default defaulters, those high profile uh, defaulters, like uh, who default in crores, mm -hmm. if you remove them from the initial thinking they are outliers, how do you build models to identify those people? Because uh, actually, if you remove them, you won't. You will never find them. But if you, yeah. but then yeah. those are the ones who are actually making more. <laughs> yes. Uh, lost the to the bank. Yes. So there are three big assumptions there. So first is the product itself. If they are defaulting on the same product that somebody is defaulting five thousand on, and these guys are defaulting one crore on. Um, that's a. So product similar. Is one scenario product dissimilar means that the product is used as a basis for segmentation, right? So going back to that example where I was talking that you segment the population first and you said these one crore guys are very different. People who have 50 lakhs to five crore kind of outstanding, they should be modeled differently. So that was one. The second is sometimes you do not remove outliers, but you cap them. Because what you are, if you are modeling for the quantum of default, that outlier guy will kill the model. If you are just trying to analyze the quality or the behavior profile or some profile of who the defaulters are, then it becomes a one-zero problem. And from a one-zero problem perspective, all you are really saying is that I want to cap uh, the outlier at let's say 2x or 3x of P99 as a theoretical example. You have to kind of keep it in context by understanding the distribution that you're looking at. But historically, uh, you know, what we have seen, and this applies to two things, missing values as well as outliers. If the outlier is significant, business significant, you should never drop it. If a missing value means something, if it is business significant, you should never drop those records. If you don't drop um, should, it, it will affect the model. It will affect the model and it will give you a very different result than what you're looking for. So you impute them with something. So what's the imputation? What is the right method for imputation is a good conversation. So different companies, different contexts, so missing values, for example, yeah. mean, median, mode, percentile distributions, all kinds of things are used for MBIs. Similarly, outlier capping on both ends. Uh, if, if loss or profit were a positive to negative kind of spectrum, both high profit or high loss might be numbers that you cap to the P99 or P1, for example, because they have a tendency to destroy the overall, you know, model, um, especially if they're going to be an independent variable and, a, and an important one. So you just want to be careful with those things. Uh, one of the examples I remember from a very subprime population was where instead of using, so income, for example, somebody may have a very, very high income, right? But my overall portfolio is whatever, 
till two hundred thousand dollars per annum kind of salary. One guy shows up at seven hundred thousand kind of a number. But if you create dummy variables sometimes, or or uh, set different categorical variables, which instead of picking uh, uh, the salary as salary, they starting salary as salary bands, and you have ten bands ordinal, one to ten, uh, where you know that ten is greater than nine is greater than eight. Um, then you introduce that variable, and you see if your model performance does not drop significantly, then you tend this basically takes care of the problem for life. Answers your question? Yes, it does. It does. Thank you. Right. Okay, um, I'm happy to uh, you know feel free to periodically drop notes. Etc. I can try and you know find some time to answer the questions. Let me uh, let me just make sure I have uh, looked at the chat session. Ah, oh, there's a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> um, there is a pass history. Can I say? Huh. So Pramod, uh, I think, uh, and Karthik had these two questions that I can put in touch. Can you please share some learning materials for business problem framing? Uh, simple ones are uh, book. Extremely difficult to get hold of. Uh, see if you can find PDFs or something online. Is uh, Barbara Minto's uh, Pyramid Principle? It's we we call it the Bible of problem solving. Uh, so that's a great book. Uh, you should also be able to find on almost all B schools uh, like Harvard, Wharton, or Kellogg's so or those kind of guys. They have these case books uh, or consulting case books as they call them. So these books, booklets, typically big PDFs have uh, frameworks, and then they have business examples of how to apply those frameworks, and they actually help you with you know not get caught in the data guys universe because you're first trying to see what problem am I really solving, and then I go looking for that data. Uh, there was this. Uh, I'll probably send it to your uh, the the uh, your team. Uh, there's a very very beautiful book about data to basically business to problems to data kind of a book. And I'm trying to struggle to remember the name, but I'll send it across to you guys. That's also a very, very good book. Um, and there is a, a visualization book by uh, Data to Message to Charts, who was the author. That book is also, the charts part is about, when you see the charts part of it, the analysis needs to make sense, right? Um, Moving to promotes questions. Uh, when we assess business factors, uh, how are these business scenarios added as features? How we make sure the business factors we are considering isn't adding randomness to our system? Uh, post processing business cases, how often are the post processing methods deterministic? The third question I think you'll have to kind of explain. But let me first address the how do we add, how are these business scenarios added as features? Um, Remember the first point about collaboration, right? So when we are talking about that 22% download kind of a scenario, there's no way for you to address that as a problem unless you go back to the tech team that designed the build, which take, which broke down the problem of file copying as a percentage of data copied problem. So now, instead of getting stuck at 20%, you will have, so now that's a design change. That's a code-based change for the tech team based on the insight that you have. So you have to, that, that's where, you know, the, the whole cross-functional teams for big problems will happen in your lifetime. When you work in companies, you'll find yourself uh, being called into these cross-functional setups. Uh, the way to, one of the things that I tell my team a lot is when I work with the bank's product team, I do not presume that I know as much about banking as them, but within a very short period of time, I want to ensure that I know more about their data than them. So I have my own weapon, they have their own weapon, and then we go clash as equals, otherwise it becomes a who's the superior, who knows more kind of problem. When that happens, then somebody dictates, somebody follows. What you want is that table where you are able to debate what it means for the business. So that was the first part. Uh, how do we make sure that we the business factors we are considering isn't adding randomness to our system? It's a very tangible risk because spurious correlation, as you would call, or correlation is not causation. That's a very, very real problem. So one of the lenses, at least, you know, this is experiential learning for me, uh, more than the statistical part of it, is that, is it a controllable or not a controllable? So if I give my clients an independent variable, which is not a control variable, 
It's something that they can't influence. So for example, a lot of clients come back to us saying, let's factor in market uh, macro variable, like economy mein kya ho hai. And my response is, yes, we can bring in, but one, they are uh, lagging indicators, as in things have already happened before you get a record of them as a macro. And second, you have literally no way of controlling it. You can only say that I will become conservative in my strategies. So find arrows which are more in the control of whoever can run it as business features or business factors to say, if I tell you that this is a problem, will you be able to fix it? So examples that we get often is, uh, can you add social media data collection to our risk underwriting problem? Of course we can add. Uh, and you'll find that 1% case where something happened, but in general, from a risk modeling perspective, um, there isn't much uh, to using social media data for risk assessment, especially in the products that we typically work on. Um, but it has that potential to add randomness. So we add, we try to demonstrate what happens when you change. So simulation is a good technique to assess uh, randomness. Um, what happens if I change the threshold by X? What happens if I introduce a new variable here? What happens if I, and then you start seeing that uh, as an iterative exercise, reduce the dependence on uh, pre-packaged model libraries to the extent and get your analyst hat on and you'll be able to spot randomness a lot better. Uh, Post-processing in business cases. Pramod, you want to just highlight what you mean by that? Uh, yeah, hello, this is Pramod. No, what I meant by is often I'm uh, in the scenarios where uh, let's say uh, after we deliver the model, before we deliver the solution to the end customer, mm -hmm. we essentially uh, may add some kind of, you know, uh, software engineering techniques over, you know, stochastic data centric techniques. Right. Now, at a system level, sometimes this adds, as, as the second question I mentioned, it does mm -hmm. add some amount of randomness. Mm -hmm. And maybe over a period of time, uh, it affects the business on a different set of data when data changes. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, how to avoid the scenarios? I mean, a part of it is actually answered in the second question, mm -hmm. but uh, that's essentially what I meant by when we are post-processing techniques, which are, you know, deterministic in nature, not stochastic models. Okay. How does this? Um Again, it was an FS problem again, higher FS bias. Um, when we get to the deployment, and that's where uh, having a good understanding of what MLOps and DevOps universes are like today will allow you to create champion challengers. So the reason why a lot of the stochastic models don't see production is because of the infra load that they have or because of some practical considerations as to why people don't want to use it. And they move into very, very heuristic, deterministic kind of uh, setups. And the moment you do that, you are essentially, because your operations has a constraint, you never really fully unlock the potential of the model. So your mo model can get blamed is one. But the second part is, uh, if I think about what happens from a model monitoring or model validation perspective, I'm no longer sure uh, whether whatever I did in the first pass is right or wrong. So one of the things we have tried to do, and I'm, I, uh, I'm a very, very practical analyst. So I acknowledge the challenges of an organization when I see one or my own also. Uh, is one of the things we keep doing is we keep maintain we almost always maintain a UAT environment where the infra load can be managed a lot differently to make sure that there's a champion challenger available. Which what allow what it has allowed us to do in a few cases is to go back to the front end to go back to the implementation there and showcase the difference that was possible. Um, that if you had allowed me to do this, this is what I would have got for you. But since you're not allowing me to do it, this is what we live with. It really is not my problem. Let's find a way to kind of get to moving the models more to the front end. Um, again, I think PSI would help you or data stability will help you. The model stability metrics would again help you. But none of that really takes away the practical challenges of taking a model to the field. These are real problems. One of the examples that you may relate to of your day-to-day -day experiences is 
when you look at something like uh, Amazon's recommendation system, people like you bought things like this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, a lot of those recommendations would seem very, very dumb. And you can safely assume that most of the people at Amazon are not dumb. It's it's more you know how the loop works and how the model is not taken to the front end. All right. I'll take a pause here and I would like to wish you all the best and uh, happy to help in any small, big way that I can. Uh, feel free to reach out, feel free to connect. Thank Over you. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. It was a pleasure having you here. I'm sure all the participants must have got a good insight about the real life case studies that you've talked about on I hope it was of some value. That's all. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone. And all the best. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you.